Hi, I'm Levi, the Quality Assurance Manager here at System76. Um, I kind of wanted to just take a little bit of time to walk through what the uh, initial QA process looks like for a brand new product. When we first get them, the very first thing that we do is pretty much what a lot of people do when they buy a piece of hardware and want to see if it runs Linux. We just try to install POP or Ubuntu and see what breaks, see what works, uh, write all of it down, uh, share with the engineers if something's not working quite right. And uh, if there's any weird little bugs or anything, we uh, write down the steps to reproduce them and share that with them. Um, and then after that, uh, if it's an open firmware model, which most of our Intel stuff has been lately, it's really cool that we've been able to do that. Um, the uh, engineering team usually takes the model and starts developing firmware and embedded controller firmware. We call that EC. Um, the EC firmware is kind of the, uh, uh, the control center, you could say, for the laptop. It controls things like power, uh, the fans, the keyboard backlight, um, the keyboard itself, uh, touchpad, things like that. Um, then there's also the BIOS firmware, or I guess just the proper firmware. Um, that's more uh, talking to the CPU and making sure that the CPU knows what to do. Um, and there's a lot of interplay between the EC firmware and the regular BIOS. Um, and that is probably a little bit above my pay grade. Uh, I just try to make sure it all works together nicely. The engineers are the ones that really uh, have the awesome knowledge of that and get really deep down into it. I know most of our engineers like to move into the machine that they're developing the firmware on. Um, that's kind of a nice touch to actually make the, the firmware from the machine that you're making the firmware for. Um, they do a lot of uh, flashing the machines externally. Um, for that, we use uh, a bunch of different tools. The main one would be the CH341A, which is this little guy I have right here. It's just a little BIOS flasher, um, although it is kind of slow. So alternatively, we also use a Raspberry Pi, um, and then we use these little clip things to interface with the uh, BIOS chip itself. It, you just clip directly onto the integrated circuit. Uh, this is the old style for the SO, uh, SOIC8 format chip. And this is the new one for the WSON8 chip. These are little pogo pins. Um, this one's much harder to do because when you're actually flashing it, you have to hold perfectly still for about 10 minutes while it's writing the uh, BIOS file to the chip. Uh, and if you move even just a little bit, you break the contact and you have to start over because you have an incomplete flash. Um, although the, the Raspberry Pi is a lot faster, so using that instead of this is definitely preferable. Um, when we're flashing the embedded controller firmware, um, that actually happens through the keyboard connector. So you remove the keyboard, uh, take out the FPC cable that connects the keyboard, and we use this uh, Arduino Mega with this little FPC breakout board, and we connect this into the keyboard connector slot, and that's able to uh, program the embedded controller firmware right there through that connector. When the engineering team has a pretty good uh, first minimum viable product for the uh, firmware and the EC firmware, um, that's when QA starts uh, steps in. Uh, we flash our own units. Uh, usually the engineers have their own unit and we have a couple of units here in the engineering lab or the QA lab. Um, so that's when we'll do the first flash, which requires those external tools. We'll take the back off, we'll access the motherboard, uh, clip right onto the BIOS chip with those tools uh, and do the very first flash. After that, um, subsequent flashes, it's much easier because you can do that just, it can internally flash itself. That's how we do firmware updates over the air. Um, it's just that first one that we have to do with the, the BIOS clip. Um, and then once we are uh, doing the, the first round of quality assurance tests on the laptops, we're kind of just making note of what works, what doesn't work. Uh, we have these uh, checklists that only get longer and longer. Every single time we find something new that needs to be tested, we add it to the list. Um, things like uh, do the hotkeys on the keyboard work, the volume up, down, touchpad lock, uh, keyboard brightness, um, there's a whole bunch of power behaviors in this too, uh, making sure with USB-C connected, you can do things like uh, USB-C charger connected. You can, uh, you know, stress the machine and the uh, EC allows it to continue to charge while uh, it's connected to, e to USB-C and stressing. Um, there's a lot of hardware compatibility, a whole bunch of charge level stuff. So drain the laptop down to 
basically zero, charge it back up all the way, make sure it comes back on as expected. Once it has a little bit of charge in it and it runs and charges from 0%, uh, charge to 100% without interruptions. Uh, there's a lot of hardware compatibility things. So we have a whole bunch of different types of NVMEs, a bunch of different types of uh, SATA drives and uh, RAM chips. Uh, we basically, we, mo we mainly focus on the uh, types of hardware that we're going to actually sell the units with, of course, because that's, you know, if you get a machine out of the box and it doesn't work right with the drive that came with the machine, that's pretty frustrating. But we also do test a lot of other brands um, because we know users are going to add drives, they're going to add RAM. Uh, so we test a whole bunch of stuff. We want to make sure that that's going to be a painless process for the users. Uh, another thing we pay a lot of attention to is power. Um, so. Uh, U-class machines like the Darter, the uh, Galago, the Lemur, the Pangolin, uh, things that have you know typically integrated graphics um, and are usually below 100 watts uh, TDP. Um, usually, those are a little bit more complicated because they do support USB-C charging. So with, that also means we have to make sure they work great with uh, docking stations. Uh, you know, it charges over USB-C. It usually delivers uh, a video signal out over USB-C, and then any USB devices that are connected to the dock, those also have to work. So that USB-C port is doing a lot of stuff right there. We have to make sure all of that is working at once. Um, if the laptop supports Thunderbolt, that's even another thing that that USB-C port has to be uh, tested with, make sure that's behaving as expected. Um, we have a, we have a, a few monitors uh, in the lab also that work the same way. Um, you connect it with USB-C, it's got USB ports on it, uh, Ethernet usually speakers, um, making sure all of that is working great while charging the machine is important. Um, <clears throat> and then we also have to check the uh, barrel charger, um, obviously for the charger that comes with the laptop. Uh, connecting the USB-C charger and the barrel charger uh, is something that the EC should be able to handle. Um, if both of them try to charge at once, it would probably, I don't know what would happen, but it'd probably be really bad, but it's something we check just to make sure nothing bad happens. Uh, uh, making sure chargers don't get overdrawn, um, making sure that the power limits that the laptop is supposed to have are um, actually how the thing is behaving. Um, you know, you don't want to start compiling a, your, your uh, project and you get halfway through and then the CPU takes too much power from the from the charger and it shuts down the charger. And sometimes also it'll overdraw the battery because the battery has a built-in circuit, sort of like a circuit breaker. You, you can only get so much out of the battery safely. <laughs> so there's safety mechanisms that turn the machine off when too much is drawn from the battery. Uh, making sure we don't hit any of those limits with the uh, embedded controller firmware is super important. Obviously you don't want your computer to turn off when you're compiling your code, very frustrating. One of the uh, things we pay a lot of attention to, uh, especially for a machine like the Gazelle here, which is a little bit of a bigger machine, draws a lot more power. Um, performance is a big deal for something like this because it's got a discrete NVIDIA graphics card. You want to make sure that's actually putting out uh, you know, all of the performance that you're looking for. People are going to play games on these things. They're going to do uh, machine learning stuff, some GPU compute stuff. Um, all of that needs to work right. So one of the things we uh, definitely test a lot of is uh, benchmarking. Uh, making sure under full power, full draw, uh, you know, the battery, the uh, AC adapter is keeping up with that. Um, as far as users that are going to use these things for gaming, um, one of the things we want to, what we always do to make sure that that's working correctly is sometimes we'll just fire up a game, just play it for a little while. Uh, one of the ones I like is uh, Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Uh, it's a little bit older at this point, but it's got a built-in benchmarking tool, um, which is super nice for me, because I can just set that thing, let it run for a few minutes while I'm working on a different machine or uh, whatever else I might be working on. Um, and it gives me empirical data. It tells me what kind of frame rate it's putting out every time. So I can see if that starts dipping, then I probably need to look into, you know, is it thermal throttling? Uh, what exactly is going on there? Other than that, sometimes I just, you know, I'll take a machine home and just play some games with it. Uh, I've been playing a lot of No Man's Sky lately. That one's pretty fun. Uh, trying to get into Elite Dangerous. That's got quite a learning curve, but I'm figuring it out. Um, but you know, just actually using it the way it's going to be used by the people that want to play games is important. Um, other than that, other performance things are done usually through a series of Pharonix test suite uh, benchmarks. Uh, that's just such a wonderful tool for gathering all kinds of awesome data. 
there's a lot of benchmarking suites at openbenchmarking.org. Um, that's usually where I go to look for a whole bunch of different ranges of tests that I run on these things. Um, we usually run uh, a lot of really CPU intensive benchmarks, making sure that that's you know, in line with expectations. Um, there's some GPU ones that we run as well, making sure that's all good. And then obviously you wanna run them both at the same time sometimes, making sure the thermal system's gonna keep up. When you're running the machine at full load like that, another thing that becomes pretty important is the, uh, the uh, acoustic performance of it. We have uh, over in the corner there, we have a sound cube. Uh, it's painted up like a big Rubik's cube. It's pretty awesome. Uh, but it's like a, you know, like a drywall and uh, wood construction with a whole, lot, a whole lot of insulation in the walls. Um, there's another layer of uh, sound deadening foam on the inside. Because um, out here in the factory, it gets pretty noisy. Um, so getting a, a little place like that where we can just get away from that background noise and just listen to what the machine sounds like in a quiet environment is uh, really useful for us. Um, you know, nobody wants a, a laptop that just wails like a harpy all the time. It sounds like a helicopter, whatever, you know, all, the, all those things are very undesirable and we want to make sure we get rid of that. So that is sort of a general overview of what the QA process looks like on a brand new product. Um, obviously I was pretty vague about a lot of it because it's just a really high level overview of a uh, pretty complicated process that sometimes takes weeks to months. If you have any questions about it, uh, feel free to reach out to me. My username in our uh, Pop! OS uh, Mattermost chat is Levi-Port, L-E-V-I-P-O-R-T. It's at chat.popos.org. Um, and if you want to reach out with any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, and with that, uh, until next time, take care.